So you've got this 3D printer from Audi. You've run the test print, but what to do now? In this video, I'll show you how to slice your own files and troubleshoot. I must say, I'm still really happy with my Audi 3D printer. It's a Cocoon Create Touch, also known as a One How Duplicator i3+. This printer has handled everything I've thrown of it so far. I haven't had a single failed print, and that includes 24 hour prints, as well as things with lots of support and overhangs. In this video, I'm gonna take you through the bundled slicing software, so you can make your own files that you find off the internet. I'm also gonna show you some solutions to common problems that you'll most likely run into. The aim is to save you time and effort. Let's begin. We're gonna start with learning to slice, and our model is the 3D Benchy. This little boat is full of character and people choose it because it's also a bit of a torture test. The overhangs and smooth surfaces are a great test for your printer to see how well it's doing. One key thing you need to understand is that 3D printers do not know what 3D models are, instead they need XY coordinates like you see in a graph. Therefore the job of the slicing software is to make these instructions. Here is our 3D Benchy. The first job the slicer does is to divide it into vertical layers from the bed up. Doubling the amount of layers will potentially have twice the quality, but it will definitely take twice the time. All 3D printers build their model from the ground up, one layer at a time. Let's have a look at the base layer to see how it works. Here is the cross section of the base layer. The printer starts by doing the perimeters, normally inside out. This is what the slicing software calls a shell. On the very bottom and the very top layers, the printer then applies solid infill. This is normally 45 degrees and created by the print head zigzagging back and forth. On the next layer, the angle of the infill is reversed to help with strength. Now let's examine a layer that's further up the benchy. For all of the layers that are immediately at the top or bottom of the print, the process is slightly different. The perimeters are still drawn to create the shell, but then an infill is applied, with a percentage as set by the user. If you double the infill, you double the strength, but it also uses a lot more plastic and takes a lot longer to print. On the SD card that came with the printer, there's an old but specially configured version of Cura just for our Cocoon Create Touch. After you install it, it should look something like this. We'll get started by importing the STL of our 3D Benchy model. A nice animation for when it loads and then you'll see automatically the bar is filling up underneath the save icon because it's beginning to slice the object in the manner that we just examined in our animation. Cura predicts a woeful print time of three and a half hours. We go up to our view menu and select layers. Cura will then spend some more time processing and finally, once it's done, we can zoom in and preview all of our tool parts that will be sent to the printer. You'd have to agree that this preview looks pretty broken. That's because this is a pretty old version of Cura. Newer versions of Cura and any other 3D printing software will give a much more complete G-code preview these days. So it won't look so hollow like in this example here. It's pretty hard to tell what's going on, so dragging the layer slider on the right will show us each layer with quite a bit more detail. We can see our 10% infill, we can see our raft on the bottom, and on the lower layers we can see that it's completely solid. As we get to the top layers we can see that they're completely solid as well. You can see on the upper left the preset is on normal, let's put it to fast and see how much faster we can get it. Everything reprocesses and when it's done it gives us a new ETA of 1 hour and 43 minutes, which is much much better. This has been achieved by thickening the layer lines and therefore having less of them. We don't however have a great deal of control, so let's put it on full settings and explore. Immediately we're presented with many more options. On the top left we have our layer height, which we explored in our animation. 0.15 is pretty high quality and a pretty good standard print is 0.2. The shell thickness is the thickness of the outer perimeter layers that are drawn before the infill. We're now going to increase the infill from 10% up to 50 to see what effect it has on print time and to see the visual difference. Now this bench here would be ridiculously strong with an infill of 50%, way more than we need. We've added a bit more printing time but really we've used heaps more plastic in the process. We're going to put it back to 10% for the rest of this video. I would suggest that a print speed of 50mm per second is a little bit slow and 60 is more appropriate. I'd also suggest that for PLA, something like 210 for the extruder and 60 degrees for the bed is going to be closer to the money. One thing that's turned on by default is the rafts. I generally hate these, they just take up heaps more time in plastic. The only time I recommend them is if I'm printing something with heaps of delicate support material and I don't want it to fall off the bed. We've shaved off another 6 minutes by removing it. I think the time has come to look at some more advanced settings. 
another little zero point four is correct, so I'll leave that. And my printer has very little stringing, so I won't touch the retraction. What I'm really interested in are in these speed settings. I think some of them are a little bit fast and some are a little bit slow. The bottom layer speed going slow right down to 20 will really help your bottom layer adhesion. Other ones can go a lot higher. Infill speed you'll never see, so crank it up to 80. The top and bottom speed, 15 I think, is far too conservative, so I like putting it on something like 30. That's still half the speed of the normal one, so it should improve the quality, but it's not going to take too much longer. I'm confident the outer shell speed can come up to 30 as well, 20 is just too slow, and you'll still get great quality from slowing it down to 30. The inner shell speed isn't quite as important as the outer shell speed, but I think 80 is a bit high and 60 is a little bit more appropriate for quality. We had a prediction of hour 39 before we made these changes and we've got it down to an hour 17. So that's worthwhile I think and we won't really lose any quality from the ones that we sped up. One thing we haven't looked at so far is support material. Cura has an option to help us with this. If we come up to the right menu and select overhangs, spinning the camera upside down will show us some regions in red. These are the bits with more overhang than what we've identified in our settings. By default this setting is 60 degrees, so everything here that's red has an overhang of more than 60 degrees. If it's red it means it has a fair chance of having trouble to print. It's not all doom and gloom however, because we have a fan on we can actually bridge across places like the top of the roof without the filament sagging down at all. If you did want to enable a support you have to go back to the basic tab and then change it from none to touching build plate or everywhere. Hitting the little sub menu will bring us up even more options to play with. The default is 60 degrees and changing this number will control whether support is added to shallow or more vertical surfaces. Changing it to 45 degrees here finally triggers support under the nose of the benchy. The preview is not very good but we can see that there's something happening there. If you're feeling really confident there's even more settings to play with in the expert config. I wouldn't really recommend you play with any of these settings without some thorough research first. We can save our g-code because we're ready to print. Here's the Cura Benchy side by side with the one I did in the first video from Simplify 3D. You can see on the roof there's some thin extrusion so you'd need to up the top layer thickness and on the sides there's a few more artifacts. Overall however the quality is pretty similar and considering it's a free slicer versus one that costs around $150, Cura did a pretty good job. So that covers a straightforward print but what about troubleshooting? In the last video I had issues with changing the filament because there was a bug that was causing the gantry to go right up to the top. Well here's a shortcut to get around that. In the quick menu go to preheat and then select PLA. Now simply wait patiently for the temperature of the extruder to hit 185. Being careful not to burn your finger, push down on the extruder release and pull out the old plastic. Cut a nice sharp edge on the end of the new filament roll. Now carefully squeeze the extruder arm again and point your filament correctly down the hole and into the waiting hot end. One of the most daunting things for a new user is if you've got a blocked nozzle. There's two common ways that this can happen. The first is letting the filament run out mid print. This means that the filament in the nozzle is sitting there baking and going hard and then eventually blocking your nozzle. The other way that this can happen is by having an incorrect bed level. It's possible for the nozzle to grind into the platform, picking up degree and clogging the tip. I'll now take you through nozzle disassembly and cleaning so you can get back on track. The first thing to note is that you need to have the nozzle up to temperature before you try any of these. And the first thing to do is to try the large silver walking cane shaped thing to push through any obstructions through the bottom. You might find a little bit of plastic comes off on it. The next thing to try is to use an 8mm spanner to undo the nozzle. However don't use the socket by itself on the nozzle as seen here or all you'll do is undo the heater block instead of the nozzle. Instead use some large pliers or vice grips to gently hold it so you can get the socket on and undo the nozzle without the heater block turning at all. Be careful when putting your hands near the nozzle because it's going to be very hot. There's a small white teflon tube inside the nozzle. Hold it with pliers and simply wiggle back and forth to get it off. Most of the time they can be cleaned off simply by using some damp paper towel. However if you need to there was a spare that came inside the packaging of the 3D printer. 
The tiny drill bit that came with the tool set should only be used if the plastic inside the nozzle is hot enough to be melted, otherwise you'll snap it. There is one surefire way I use to clean my nozzles. Apply a blowtorch or a really hot flame to them until they're glowing light red. This will vaporise any plastic inside and after it cools down naturally in the air it'll be ready to reinstall clean as a whistle. With the extruder set to hot, quickly use your fingers to get the thread started on the nozzle before switching to a tool to do it up tightly. You can then hopefully load up your filament and get printing again. This Audi 3D printer is a tremendous gateway into the 3D printing world. Hopefully with the tips presented in this video you'll be able to further your knowledge and become more and more independent. When you get sick of printing the things on Thingiverse and other free sites, I really recommend that you go forward and start designing your own parts with CAD. Check out my Onshape series, aimed at complete beginners to get going. See you next time. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.